Templin Institute investigates alternate worlds, but as is the case with today's video, that can sometimes take us a bit of a long time. If you'd like some more succinct opinions, or you'd like to share with us your own, follow the Templin Institute on Twitter. You'll find the link in the description below. It follows then, as certain as that night succeeds the day, that without the decisive naval force we can do nothing definitive, and with it everything honorable and glorious. If you were an admiral within the Galactic Empire, the Confederacy of Independent Systems, the New Republic, or any other power that has tried to assert its dominance over the galaxy, chances are you would agree with that sentiment. History is littered with so-called galactic governments, but all too often, their influence and sovereignty only extend so far as their starfleets can reach. Therefore, with the success of a government so closely tied to the capabilities of its navy, the question arises. Which of the galactic powers across history has possessed the most capable interstellar starfleet? And how might the Templin Institute rank them amongst one another? This of course is a big question. And the argument might be made that all the interstellar navies to ever aspire to galactic dominance are simply too different to make any valid comparison. That might be true, but I think if we look at the capabilities of each navy in certain areas, we might arrive at what is at least an approximate hierarchy. So let us begin with our selections. Without going too far back into galactic history, which at this point at least is still shrouded in legends, there are six interstellar navies I believe we can compare with at least some degree of accuracy. The Republic Starfleet of the Galactic Republic, the Separatist Navy of the Confederacy of Independent Systems, the Imperial Starfleet of the Galactic Empire, the Rebel Fleet of the Alliance to Restore the Republic, the New Republic Defense Fleet of the New Republic, and the First Order Navy of the First Order. Given some of these navies operated decades apart and under vastly different circumstances, we can't simply just look at which fleet would destroy the others in a straight up engagement. Instead, we'll be grading on a kind of curve and looking at the capabilities of each force in the following areas. Operating Forces How effective are the fleets, starships, and starfighters fielded by each navy in supporting the overall objectives of that navy? Are they balanced and flexible? Power Projection How well can each navy sustain its forces across the whole of the galaxy, and to what extent do these forces act as a credible deterrent? Area Denial and Control To what extent can the navy restrict areas of interstellar space or planetary systems to an opponent, or establish dominance over them for their own purposes? Leadership and Doctrine How well do those in command provide purpose, direction, and motivation? Do they draw well-informed conclusions on which they can act appropriately to any given situation? Each of these criteria will be rated as poor, fair, average, good, or excellent. Now, before we jump in, it does need to be mentioned that these criteria are not easy to measure, nor are they entirely independent from one another. Effective leadership, for example, can strengthen every other category. With that in mind, let's begin with the Republic Navy. I think it's important to first note that unlike every other Starfleet we'll be discussing, the Republic Navy really didn't exist prior to the outbreak of open conflict. The Republic itself might have had a strong naval tradition going back tens of thousands of years, but very few people alive at the outbreak of the Clone Wars had any experience to fall back upon. The fact that the Republic Navy could expand to a wartime footing so quickly and seamlessly is impressive in itself. Starting with their operating forces, the Republic was in a very strong position. One of the benefits of starting nearly from scratch is that everything can be designed to work together, and there's not much of a mishmash between modern and older equipment. The Republic fleet, in particular, was well balanced, with capable, modern capital ships, escorts, and starfighters. The only element it seemed to lack, however, is what a successor in the Imperial Navy would later embrace, Star Dreadnoughts. In at least one instance, the Confederacy deployed a ship class to which the Republic had no direct counter and took severe losses as a result. But despite that, because of their well-balanced, modern, standardized forces, I'm classifying the operating assets of the Republic as good. In terms of power projection, the Republic was extraordinarily capable. 
and this is best exemplified during its very first engagement. The first battle of Geonosis is, I believe, one of the greatest strategic masterstrokes in history. The Republic Navy delivered a sizable expeditionary force into the heart of enemy territory, evacuated surrounded friendly elements, and then redeployed them to secure victory in a neighboring battlefield. And again, all in its very first operation as a functional navy. This kind of power projection was seen throughout the remainder of the conflict, with the Republic able to counter the moves of the Confederacy wherever they occurred, from the Outer Rim to the Core Worlds. I am grading their power projection as good. Area, denial, and control is where the Republic Navy begins to suffer, and in my opinion, slightly underperforms. Even during the final year of the war, in which the Republic had largely pushed the Confederacy to the Outer Rim, it was still unable to prevent a sizable enemy force from attacking Coruscant directly. You can blame this failure on a few mitigating factors, but it is still an immense embarrassment to the Republic Starfleet. I am classifying the Republic here as good. It should probably be average, but they get a few bonus points just by virtue of winning the Clone Wars. Leadership and doctrine is again where the Republic underperforms. It's natural for civilian and military leadership to begin to disagree with one another in certain areas, but attempting to insert the Jedi Order into the mix only amplifies this problem. An untested Jedi Padawan, for example, should never have been placed in a position where they outranked veteran clone troopers. Likewise, there's no guarantee that a Jedi Knight automatically makes for a more capable captain or admiral. Between the oversight of the Senate, the military leadership within the clones, and the more philosophically driven Jedi, the leadership and the doctrine of the Republic Navy is being pulled in different directions that impacts its overall effectiveness. I rate it as fair. This brings us to the Republic's wartime rival, the Separatist Navy. Unlike the Republic fleet, this existed in one form or another well before the Clone Wars or even the creation of the Confederacy itself. It was split, however, between the Confederacy's major constituent corporations, and this is where I think many of its problems stem from. I do have a soft spot for the Confederacy starships, at least aesthetically, but it can't be denied that the Separatist fleet was an almost random assortment of repurposed civilian craft, mostly heavily modified bulk transports. This would begin to change by the end of the war, but for the most part, there was no real standardization within their fleets. Producing the necessary ammunition and replacement parts for a ragtag fleet like this is likely to consume far more of the Confederacy's industry than a comparable Republic force. Their fleets might have been well balanced with a variety of capital ships, escorts, and starfighters, but none of them were specifically designed to act in concert with one another. You have advanced star dreadnoughts like the Malevolence being used alongside centuries-old cargo freighters. I have to grade their operating assets as fair at best. What's impressive about the Separatist Navy's wartime performance, though, is that despite the hodgepodge nature of its operating forces, it was still able to largely match the Republic in both power projection and area denial and control. For most of the Clone Wars, the Separatists seemed to have the initiative, overcoming the early embarrassment on Geonosis to expand the conflict across the whole of the galaxy. That the Separatist fleet, largely inferior, as we previously discussed, can raid the capital of the Galactic Republic in the final year of the war is an extraordinary feat. In terms of power projection, I'm classifying them as good. In area control and denial, the Confederacy has the same basic problems as the Republic, especially as the war goes on, so I'm putting them at average. Leadership within the Separatist Starfleet is tricky, as we now know that the entire Confederacy was being manipulated at the highest levels by Palpatine. The Republic was too, but the Confederacy was never intended to actually win the Clone Wars, rather just to serve as a catalyst to create the Clone Army that could topple the Republic internally. Therefore, many of the orders at the strategic level were deliberately self-defeating to the Confederacy. Further down the chain of command, though, even with those unaware of Palpatine's plans, Separatist naval doctrines and leadership aren't great. Commanders retain their assignments even in the face of multiple defeats brought about by negligence or incompetence. The Malevolence Campaign is a good example of this. A Separatist dreadnought, for which the campaign was named, likely the largest and most powerful warship constructed by either side during the conflict, was destroyed in the first few months of the Clone Wars 
having achieved very little of consequence. To deploy such a warship, completely unsupported, as a glorified commerce raider during a time when the Separatists should have been pursuing a decisive battle is a major misstep. In this case, it resulted in the total loss of one of the Separatists' most valuable assets. Separatist leadership I am grading as poor. Now we arrive at the combatants of the Galactic Civil War, starting with the Imperial Starfleet. Since its destruction, I feel like the Empire has had its reputation dragged through the mud a bit. Some of this is well deserved, but not all of it. We can't forget that the Empire was essentially the victor of the Clone Wars, and their operating forces reflect this. The level of standardization pioneered by the Republic was further reinforced under the Empire, incorporating the lessons of its predecessor. It also filled the gaps present in the Republic Navy, deploying Star Dreadnoughts in greater numbers than probably any other power in galactic history. Ship for ship, the Empire was completely dominant in its era. I rate its operating forces as excellent. In terms of power projection, the Empire achieved a state of dominance over the galaxy unseen in tens of thousands of years, and might never be seen again. Even at their respective heights, neither the Republic and Separatists ever controlled anything more than a fraction of what would become the Galactic Empire. That the Imperial Starfleet could maintain a presence across the entirety of the Core Worlds, the Mid-Rim, the Outer Rim, this was an astonishing feat. Even in backwater territories or hazardous regions, the Imperial Navy, if they wanted to, was capable of deploying significant assets. I am grading their power projection as excellent. Now, this is notably higher than either the Republic or the Confederacy, which might be unfair since we can only really speculate on how their respective naval forces might have consolidated power across the whole of the galaxy. Theoretically, they may have done better or worse, but the Empire actually achieved this, so they get the extra points. Both their enormously capable operating forces and unrivaled power projection gave the Empire immense area denial and control. For the majority of the Galactic Civil War, the Rebel Alliance was completely unable to seize any territory without it quickly falling to Imperial counterattacks. Up until the death of the Emperor and the creation of the New Republic, if the Imperial Navy wanted to hold the system, there was nothing in the galaxy that could stop them. I rate their area denial and control as excellent. We of course though can't ignore the fact that the Imperial Navy and the Empire it served ultimately failed and when the first cracks in its foundation appeared, its complete collapse happened very quickly. This comes down to its leadership. The Imperial Starfleet fell into the same mistakes that seemed to disproportionately affect autocracies. Those at the highest levels prized loyalty and ideology above merit. There were undoubtedly competent admirals and commanders within its service, but they were forced to work within a rigid system that actively worked to crush all the attributes that make for good leaders. Doctrinally, the Imperial Navy was also just stuck in the Clone Wars. Had the Empire been fighting a rival superpower like the Confederacy, or maybe some extra-galactic nomadic horde, I think they would have wiped the floor with them. But that wasn't the case. The doctrine of the Empire proved to be inflexible, and as the Galactic Civil War ran its course, the Imperial Starfleet failed to truly understand the nature of the conflict they were involved in. Their leadership I grade as poor. Just as the Empire was the evolution of the Republic, the alliance to restore the Republic was in some strange sense a continuation of the Confederacy, and we see this reflected in its naval forces. Even more so than the Separatist fleet, the Rebellion was forced to use a random hodgepodge of starships and starfighters, most of which were completely unsuited to military service. Even their most formidable warships were converted from some other purpose and hardly a match for their Imperial counterparts. Only in their Starfighter Corps did the Alliance maintain an edge, but this was never enough to directly challenge the Empire in anything other than hit-and-run attacks. Again, their fleets might have been balanced, with an array of capital ships, escorts, and smaller craft, but this did not reflect an intentional plan on the part of the Rebellion, rather it signified their desperation. A few standouts aside, I have to grade them as poor. It should come as no surprise then that their ability to project power was heavily affected by this. As previously discussed, the Rebellion was completely unable to seize territory in any meaningful way. It was secrecy that kept the Alliance intact, so I have to rate their power projection at poor as well. 
The same, unfortunately, goes for their area denial and control. Rebel victories and straight-up naval engagements were exceedingly rare, and typically only the prelude to an Imperial counterattack that would erase whatever territorial gains had been made. That said, as the rebellion grew in strength, it did become more capable of engaging Imperial forces, but it was never enough to achieve a total military victory over the Imperial Starfleet. I judge their area denial and control as poor. From this, it might seem like the Alliance Navy would be completely ineffective, but we have to remember that a Starfleet is ultimately just another tool to be utilized in achieving certain conditions or objectives. Sophisticated and standardized operating forces, capable of galaxy-wide power projection, supreme area denial and control, aren't necessary if your only objective is to retrieve a data card with sensitive information. In both their leadership and doctrine, the Alliance Navy understood this perfectly. Unlike the Empire, which never grasped the kind of war it was fighting, the Rebellion's leadership was fully committed to conducting their campaign in the manner that benefited them the most. Being aware of their strengths, and most importantly, their weaknesses, the Rebel Alliance was able to avoid the kinds of engagements they had no chance of winning, and instead merely harass the overextended Imperial Starfleet. This was an immensely dangerous way to conduct themselves. A single misstep could end the entire effort, but it was a delicate path that Rebel leadership was able to walk with astonishing clarity and effectiveness. I rate their leadership and doctrine as excellent. Now we arrive at the First Order and the New Republic, and as the Institute has spent great lengths discussing, it is impossible to analyze this era without heading firmly into the realm of conjecture and speculation. The defense fleet of the New Republic in its early years shared most of the characteristics of the Rebel fleet, and likely never evolved beyond this. This is a major problem. For the New Republic had vastly different and extended responsibilities compared to the Rebellion. The ragtag collection of discarded starships might have been enough for fighting a guerrilla war, but as the professional starfleet of a major interstellar state, it was completely inadequate. However distasteful it might have been to the New Republic's civilian leadership, a new line of purpose-built peacekeeping warships would have been much more effective than merely employing modernized variants of whatever ships the Rebellion had fielded. Just as a case in point, it always seems strange to me that the New Republic was using MC-85s and Nebulon C escort frigates. The Rebellion used their predecessors not because they were the best ships for the job, but because it was all they could scrounge up. The New Republic doesn't have these limitations, so why settle? I rank their operating forces as fair. In terms of power projection and area denial and control, there's not really enough information to go on. It seems fitting to merely rank them as fair. That the New Republic survived for as long as it did seems to indicate its defense forces possessed at least some ability in both these areas, but it definitely lacked the political willpower to excel here. And just like with the Empire, the New Republic failed to understand what their navy would be expected to achieve and largely failed to support it doctrinally or at the highest levels of leadership. We could extend to the New Republic a bit of leeway here. As we've discussed before, given the same circumstances, we might have made these same choices, but that doesn't change the fact that the New Republic defense forces were of little to no consequence in the war against the First Order, and a large part of this cannot be blamed on anything other than negligence. I am rating their leadership and doctrine as poor. Now we end with the First Order. At first, it does seem like their naval forces have achieved their stated aim of improving upon the Galactic Empire, but these advancements are typically only surface level. Their operating forces are impressive though, with their various Star Destroyers and Dreadnoughts, all notably improved evolutions of their Imperial Era counterparts. The First Order fleet though, from what we've seen of it so far, seems to be top-heavy, disproportionately unbalanced towards larger capital ships at the expense of escorts. In one battle, they might have achieved total victory and ended the war if their primary fighting formation had possessed just a few starships faster than a heavy cruiser. Regardless of whether or not the First Order fielded such ships, to not include them in a fleet of such size and importance is ineptitude of the highest order. I rate their operational forces as average. And ultimately, this affects their ability to project power as well. When it comes to dominating an entire planetary system, there's few starships more capable than a Star Destroyer. But what about those cases where the same result might have been achieved by a frigate or a cruiser 
with a fraction of the resources. The First Order's lack of balance in its operating forces means that while they might be able to project power as well as the Empire, it's going to cost them a lot more to do so. I have to rank their capability in this area as merely good. Area Denial and Control is the one aspect in which the First Order truly matches the capabilities of the Empire. Even had the New Republic fleet survived the attack on Hosnian Prime, it's difficult to imagine a situation in which they would have prevailed against the First Order's Starfleet. Again, however, this is only because they are still stuck in that Clone War mindset. Nevertheless, I rate their area denial and control at excellent. In terms of leadership and doctrine, the First Order repeats all the mistakes of the Galactic Empire to the point where they are nearly identical. They have prioritized loyalty over merit and failed to adapt to the kind of war they were forced into fighting. Their leadership is ultimately poor. So having analyzed each of these navies, how might we rank them from least to most capable? It might be tempting to assign a numerical value to each of our ratings, 5 for excellent, 1 for poor, and tally up all our winners that way but I don't think this would give us an accurate assessment of their overall capabilities. We instead need to look at how each Starfleet utilized its advantages and overcame its weaknesses to support the actions of its government. In this, I think the clear loser is the New Republic Defense Fleet, coming in last at number 6. This might have been the force that beat the Empire, but it failed to adapt to its new status and maintain its relevance within the Republic it restored. At number 5, we have the First Order Navy. It might have been a professional, standardized force, but it lacked flexibility and meaningful leadership. And in what might be our first controversial ranking, at number 4, we have the Republic Navy. Despite its formidable capabilities in most areas, its leadership failed to utilize them effectively. It had enormous advantages over the Confederacy, it was unable to bring about a quick end to the Clone Wars. As crazy as it sounds, the Separatist Navy takes third place. In every meaningful category, it either only matched or ranked lower than the Republic, and yet it managed to fight them to a near standstill for three years. It embarrassed its opponent over Coruscant, and depending on who you talk to, might have even had a chance to win the war. So why is that? Well, going by our criteria, it's hard to find the answer. Maybe they were just lucky. Maybe they had some X factor I haven't taken into account, or maybe I'm just completely off in my initial analysis here. At number 2, we have the Imperial Starfleet. Now it is true that when it began to fall apart, it fell apart fast, but I don't think that should take away from the fact that this institution enabled the Empire's control over the galaxy for roughly 23 years. Not a long time in the context of galactic history, but 23 years longer than any other professional navy. For what it was designed to do, the Imperial Starfleet was extremely effective. And finally, at number 1, we have the Rebel Fleet. Outmatched in every conceivable way, yet perfectly utilized to achieve the objectives of the Alliance. This might be easy to do when you have every advantage, but far harder when presented with the limitations the Rebellion was forced to operate under. But that, of course, is just my opinion. And even though the Templin Institute operates the only accredited interdimensional intelligence apparatus, I'd like to hear your thoughts. What do you think about our rankings? What might yours look like? And was our entire basis for analyzing these navies flawed from the start? Let us know in the comments below, and until next time, this has been Incoming. In Incoming, the Templin Institute discusses the theories and ideas found across alternate worlds. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to join the Templin Institute, consider pledging to our Patreon page. Along with increased security access, you'll be able to vote in polls to determine future topics, get custom wallpaper every week, and receive some other exclusive rewards. 